You're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox on Cal OS with my guest, Joe Bonamassa. How are you, Joe? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. Thank you for coming in. It's a, it's a new setup here, man. You got a, like a studio audience. Everybody's excited. <laughs> yeah, when you came over last time, it was at the old station, and uh, that was a couple of years ago? Yeah, it was a couple of years ago. It was just a bunch of AM guys, like, like, like self-loathing, you know? <laughs> Now it's like a rock and roll audience in a yeah. rock and roll station. By the way, congrats on 50 years. Next year will be 50 years of KLOS in Los Angeles. You got an album coming out in uh, September 21st. And uh, the album's called Redemption. That's right. Why is it called that? Well, we did a, we did a, um, uh, a record about three years ago um, called Blues of Desperation. And as we, we like to call it, it was the feel good hit of the summer. And, you know, it, it was just kind of like, the, you know, I just turned 41 years old and I've gone through my 30s. I've, I've you know, lived some life and, and you know, you, you start making some changes and, you know, health wise, life wise, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I stopped drinking alcohol. I stopped, I stopped a lot of things. I stopped, you know, just, I stopped collecting guitars, if you can believe that. Well, you've, you've probably, there's probably none left. No, exactly. And, you know, and, and you, know, you just, you just kind of wake up one day and you go, man, you know, like, I, I, not that I, like, did horrible stuff. You just go, man, I want to be redeemed. I want to at least get some perspective on life. And I started making, writing this album, and I didn't know I was going to be making all these changes when I started writing it. And then as it kind of just shaped up and, and we started putting the songs together, Redemption was this kind of subconscious theme that kept coming out. Mm. So I'm excited. It's a, it's a, I think I was like 14th or 15th solo album. You know, I've, I've done like 38 albums in like 20 years, which is crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, and we have like 38 albums out. We have four bobbleheads and a back scratcher and an ashtray that looks like a flying V, which I should have brought you with. Oh, man. I'm like the Krusty the Clown of the Blues. I've, mer I've merchandised everything, so. It's, it's too bad you uh, stopped buying guitars because I think Gibson wants some help. Yeah, well, you know. Did you think uh, about buying Gibson? No, I mean, I know the people that are, are, are taking over Gibson and they're, and they're good guys, they're guitar guys. And you know what? What a lot of people don't realize about Chapter Eleven is people go, "Oh, Chapter Eleven! Like, oh my God, the place is going out of business. There won't be a Les Paul. There won't be a Flying V." No, Chapter Eleven is basically designed to keep the wolves at the door at bay. Yeah. You know, and allow a company that's very, you know, a good company ultimately to just have a chance. You know. To, to, to kind of restructure and you know before they have to pay their light bills and everything else and yeah so they, it's gonna be great um, there was a rumor that I was buying Gibson and really I was, yeah. I was kidding no there was a rumor that I was it, it circulated around the internet and if we know anything in 2018 everything you read online is 100% true and vetted <laughs> and yeah they said I, said I was gonna buy Gibson and I just go man how how well off do you think I am? I play blues rock for a living, you know. <laughs> you know, it's 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 like a it's like a vow of poverty. You, you play blues, you know. And I'm like, how are we gonna buy a guitar company? And um, but no, the people that are gonna take it over are gonna be great. And and there'll always be a Gibson, man. There'll always be a guitar. Is it a new? So who's do you know? Who's, is it common knowledge who's taking it over? Um, not yet. But um, the people that are people that are taking it over are great. And um, you know, they, they have to kind of rename some management and, yeah. and stuff like that but it's still functioning i mean they're they're still making guitars every day you know I, yeah. I i have friends over there i've been i've been working god we've sold speaking of crusty the clown of the blues we've sold almost ten thousand joe bonamassa gibson guitars in like the last 10 years which is crazy it's a testament to the fan yeah i don't know you know i, I think i made enough to buy a a, a, a vente latte from from that, <laughs> all ten thousand. So you have a signature on uh, Gibson. Yeah, yeah, I have. Uh, we've done like four or five different Les Pauls. We've done a Firebird. We've done a Flying V. 
Um, we've done a three thirty five, and we've done a, we've done a bunch of stuff over there, and uh, it's it's been a great relationship because you know I'm a guitar geek, and I've embraced that, and that's something that I've I you know when I was coming up in the business. You know, in 2000, 99, 2000, back when the record companies were still record companies and they would give you this horrible advice. And they'd be like, man, you got to stop, you know, being such a nerd, Joe. You got to stop because it's not marketable. People need to, they want a badass. They they want this projection of, of rock star. I'm like, I'm like, look at me, folks. I mean, look at me. I mean... It, it, maybe some of you know me from the suit and the sunglasses, but that's like, you know, I'm like, look, I look like I'm auditioning for Men in Black 5, you know, and and this is it. So I've just kind of embraced it and it's worked, you know, because fortunately the nerds of guitardom needed a voice and we've kind of found it and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's, it's, it's been a great experience so far. So. Was that your idea with the uh, suit and the sunglasses? Yeah, you know, um, I used to watch those old films back in when I was a kid. They used to have these VHS tapes of, of these blue shows that they recorded in Germany. And they they caught, like, you know, Muddy Waters and, you know, Howl Wolf. And, and all these guys would come out and they had these great custom-made suits. And I remember reading, a, a I believe it was a British review of one of my concerts. And... One of, the, one of the nice things that they said about me, among other things, other than I was fat, um, they said I look like a slob. <laughs> so I went to Sears in Roebuck, and I went and I said, give me your finest activewear pronto. And I went and bought some Sears activewear and um, uh, some cheap sunglasses, like literally like, 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 I would say airport grade or less, you know, stuff that you would find in a truck stop. Yeah. They were a truck stop, yeah, you yeah. know, you know, and and I put it on and it was a really horrible fitting suit, ill fitting suit. And I went up there and it was the start of this kind of persona and image that only comes out at eight o'clock because it's a, it's it's almost like a character. When I put the suit on and the sunglasses, I go out there and I'm I portray a persona that is not real you know I mean to meet me on the street is to be disappointed in many ways you know because it's not it's it's not that guy you know I'm a different guy and so that's that's when it all started and that started about 12 or 13 maybe 14 years mm -hmm. ago it took a minute it took a minute to catch on yeah it still it still is you know I'm I, at best on my best day I'm like an F G or H level celebrity, you know. <laughs> I think you should get a white one, a white suit. I did that in Vegas one time. Oh, never mind. Then. And I, 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 well, I did that in Vegas, and the last time we played, we played Caesar's Palace, and my idea for the marketing, we we played the the theater at Caesar's Palace. My idea for the marketing there was, I'm like, man, you gotta put me like dress me up in a suit, get me like an evil Knievel, yeah. you know, outfit, and with a guitar you know they didn't like that idea <laughs> and me being kind of a rebel i know a collector buddy of mine in vegas and, and he's got like one of those old-timey 70s evil knievel helmets yeah for the encore i came out in full evil knievel white suit that's right that's right what are you, what are you, what are you gonna do kick me out and it was the last song yeah you know but that's you know that's that's kind of fun but the white suit works only for Las Vegas, because it seems like it, once you once you get into that you know seven o two area code, it's more acceptable to wear an all white you know. Yeah, you do anything there. That's right. Well, um, would you uh, if you had to go to a desert island, what would be the one guitar that you would take with you, if they had electricity? That is. I always say that if I was you know like a desert island, I'd have a lot bigger problems than wear a, wear a guitar, <laughs> but, you know. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I would take one. I would learn how to. I would okay, forget live the desert the island. Yeah. Forget the desert island. If you, if you, they said, okay, get rid of all your guitars, but you got to keep one. This is it. That one. This is it. This T is Tally. um. This is a Fender Telecaster. It was built in 1953, just in Fullerton, California. You realize rock and roll started just about. 
25 miles from here in Fullerton, California. And I saved up my money. Um, I, I started to make a little bit of money playing gigs, a little bit. And I kind of saved up money. And I'd always been a collector. And I took lessons from a guy when I was a kid. His name was Danny Gatton. I'm not sure if anybody's heard of him. Yeah, but he, yeah a few guys have heard of him. And he was, he was this kind of cult hero, telecaster, like freak of nature. And he was very much in the same era and style of like Roy Buchanan. So, you know, he'd play all that stuff. And he had a tally like this that I kind of learned on. And somebody sent me a picture of this guitar. This was years and years and years ago. And, and it looked like Danny's old guitar. And I bought it. And I couldn't afford it, but I just bought it. You ever like say, I'll, I'll take it, and then I'll figure out how to pay it later. And then you kind of like barter. You're like, hey, can I get some time, like forever, to pay for this? Can I give you a dollar a week for yeah. 20,000 weeks? You know I mean? It's like something like that. And so the guy was nice enough. He gave me the guitar. And it's one of those, one of those things where if I had to sell everything, knock on wood, just for the radio effect, and if I had to sell everything and get rid of it, I would keep this guitar because at the end of the day, this guitar showed me that you could you could play as mellow, you know, blues on it, you know, or whatever whatever you're playing. But you also can use it as a weapon. When I figured out I could yeah. use a guitar as a weapon, I was like really intrigued. You know? <laughs> Guy. Thank you. I was not trying to get cheap applause, but I will accept it graciously. Now, when I figured out I can use a guitar as a weapon, I was all about it. Because the beautiful thing about the blues is, and what I love to do dynamically, is lull a crowd into this false sense of, of, of you know, just when they're about to go Kenny G on you. <laughs> just get them real mellow and then, and then turn the volume up to stun. And then pin them back on the seats like the Max L men. You remember the, I'm dating myself, remember the Max L cassette? Yeah, know, with like, the hair. The hair, you know. You know who that was in that chair? Who? What was that guy? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 he's a rock and roller. He's uh, um, um, Peter Murphy. Did you know that? I think it was, anyway. Well, it is Do you know who Peter Murphy no. is? He was in Bauhaus. Oh, okay, okay. Anyway. Just a side note. Do you think he walks around now to this day going, that was me? That's me. That's me. Nah. I'm the guy in the chair. Nah, no. Um, <laughs> do you do it, did you do any, um, are we doing good, Shovel? Should we play some music? Um, did, you do, did you do a signature with um, Fender? We did an amp um, this year. We did an amp. Uh, they, um, they used to make this thing called a twin, which you used, you used with the Sex Pistols. And yeah. you talked about this last time. You used a Fender Twin. And they made the first version of the Fender Twin that they made was this kind of yellow box. And it was, eight, well, by the time it fit 1959, it was this 80 watt yellow box that Keith Richards still uses and a lot of these guys still use. And they'd not reissued it. And about two years ago, I said, why don't you reissue the 5859 high power twin, the one that you can make enemies with? It's great. You know, it's like, I love it. And we started talking, and then they, um, they weren't so convinced that they could sell a loud amplifier because now, in, in, sadly, in the world of rock and roll and the way music is in 2018, all of a sudden, the guitar, loud guitar, has become the typhoid Mary of music, you know? And it's like, you know, please turn down, please turn down. You haven't even, I haven't even plugged in yet. And people go, people go, oh my God, please turn down. Don't hurt me with your guitar. I'm like, well, that's the whole point is to hurt you with a guitar, right? Whole point, man. And so we ended up doing this and we ended up selling them on our website and we sold out. And, um, and everybody, and I, and I made sure um, to put a sample setting on there because everybody wants to know, like, geez, you know, Joe, you know, how do you set your amplifier? Well, I set it for as loud as it'll go. 
and it's loud and people play them in small rooms and it will it will scare animals into having babies you know it's that, it's that loud and so everybody i run across that is that is bought the amplifier they said you know i go have you tried the sample setting and they're like yeah but my wife said please don't do that again and i had to sell the amp so yeah, we've done we've done a few things with fender and gibson and all that kind of stuff yeah i want to get one of them uh jeff beck ones uh fender have a, is a the signature str- the like strat- stratocaster the white strat right yeah with uh with the uh what they call that wood the dark wood rosewood is that basically what he uses all the time yeah yeah i think he's only he's had the same guitar for for a long time and the thing about jeff beck you know when when they rate guitar players and there's always that rolling stone list that everybody gets yeah. hot and bothered about Are the 100 greatest of all time and everybody it, it all it is is one big clickbait wind up when you think about the greatest rock guitar player of all time going back now five decades since the late 60s my money's on jeff beck because in 68 he was pioneering this when he did with rod stewart singing and it predated zeppelin and then he you know he did all those great instrumental records in the 70s and the 80s and 90s and to me he still plays better than any human being could play the guitar on the planet to this day and i think he just i don't think he would mind if i disclose his age because it was public but he just turned 73 years old and he can still beat any young kid guitar player any optimistic guitarist named joe b beat him down into submission same to where same he, initials yeah same initials <laughs> yeah same initials way more talent for him but you know it and it, it, you know it, it's amazing when he's able to to because everybody starts with one of these you know and it's what you choose to do with it you know there's a finite amount of notes but you know your hands and your heart become a big factor in all this so. he um he he i like he, he don't bend notes anymore he just used the, the the whammy bar right? yeah yeah i mean did he always do that well when he played a less oh he played he played more traditional but now bending it's, notes. it's yeah but now it's you know he he he's found his whole yeah different but he doesn't use a pick no either. pick yeah <laughs> always had those so he would see I'm a, I'm a I am. he's showing off again I am any excuse well I mean it's, it's you know I, I live here in Los Angeles and you know it's it's some of my friends are listening and they'll stop bugging me about getting a real job one of these days and <laughs> I'm on with Steve Jones so it's uh, I've made it here that that Oh please, <laughs> that um, the the song uh, Silver Lining. Hi ho, Silver yeah. Lining. Yeah, I, I remember that as a kid. And I thought, oh, this is amazing this track. But when you listen to it, he, he's he's doubling the lead, not very accurately, but it's so great. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, and I think it's the only song he ever sang. Yeah, he he sang that, and he sang the second verse of "Let Me Love You, Baby" off of the Truth Record. And that was the that was pretty much the. The entirety of his singing yeah. career. I like the fact that he was a big fan of, uh, of, um, oh man. Cliff Gallup? No, my bloody head. Uh, memory. Uh, Hank Marvin. Do you know? Right, right, Hank Marvin. From The Shadows. That's right. He was a big fan of him. Yeah. With the, with the, with the Acoplex. Yeah. Yeah, the the shadows was they. I mean, in the UK, that's why everybody wanted a red Stratocaster. Yeah, it was because of Fiesta Hank Red. Fiesta Red. Yeah. Was it a journeyman? Basically, I think Cliff Richards got it from uh, America and yes. brought it back. That's right. And gave it to Hank. Yeah, there was only there was there was not that many American guitars in the UK in the late fifties, right. early sixties. Burns, Burns, and and a lot of imports from like Sweden, like all that stuff yeah burns. by the way anyone in sitting in the audience out here in the room and and at home in the car on the 405 this is stuff not to speak about ever on a first date 
<laughs> if you have any intentions of getting a second one. None of this stuff. You don't talk about Hank Marvin. You don't talk about <laughs> Fiesta Red. You don't talk about Burns. It's, of all, London. Up, it's all over. None of that stuff. It's all because, over. Because, hey, can I call you again? No. No, you can't. Yeah. Please get away from me, you creepy nerd. <laughs> we're here with Joe Bonamassa, and we're going to play your new single. Oh, my God. We have Red a single? Redemption. Oh, my God. I haven't, you know, I'll be honest with you. I've not even heard this song. Well, you're going to hear it now. I have not heard how it came out. You know what I wrote this with? Oh. Dion. No. The legendary Dion. The Wanderer. Yeah, the Wanderer. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dion, I mean... What did he do? Write the words? He wrote the chorus. And he, you know, he lives in South Florida. And he is, is active and is musically active, physically active. And, and he just can sing like he, when he was 19... Yeah, and great he's amazing, voice. amazing, and he's become a good friend. And and we just hang with him, and he starts singing this these blues songs to you, and you forget it's Dion. It's yeah. the wonder he was there. He was there with Buddy Holly yeah, and the Big yeah. Bopper and Richie Valens. I mean, he was part of that show. But he wrote a lot, a lot of stuff too. He wrote a lot of stuff, and and he was one of the one of the pioneers of one of the founding fathers, like yeah. a Chuck Berry type. Yeah, yeah. He don't get the credit though. He doesn't. He doesn't. But you know, I think it's one of those. He's one of those artists because he's in such good shape and, and so active and, and so good still, that that people almost take him for granted. Yeah. But it's Dion. You know, you yeah. know it's the one. Yeah. I, I hear he likes to get around. He does. <laughs> We're gonna play the new single, Jonesy's jukebox, Cal West, Joe Bonamassa, Redemption. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Steve, do they, do they charge people to get in here? Uh, I'm not sure, do they? No. I don't think so. Oh, okay, good, because the mistakes are free for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, th those are on the house. That was very good. You should, you should do it for a living. <laughs> um, so, uh, what else? What else is going on? You got a gig at the Greek. I have a gig at the Greek. On, the, on August. Yeah, you know, I when I, I you know I've been here August first. August first at the Greek Theater. You know, it's 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 not lost on me the journey that I've had over now. It's my thirtieth year playing professionally. Um, my grandfather, in nineteen eighty nine, well eighty eight eighty nine, we we did a gig in upstate New York, and he he collected five dollars at the door, and that was like my first gig. So it's been, I've been doing this for almost thirty years, and. 
when I moved to Los Angeles, one of the first first apartment that they would rent me because I had no credit, no prospects, no money, uh, no personality, and, and, and no future, um, was in Los Feliz. And I, I rented a place on Los Feliz Boulevard. And all I would notice back in those days in the summertime was this, this, this kind of caravan parade of very nice shiny tour buses driving up the hill to the Greek theater. Yeah. And some of the local restaurants would have the the concert calendar in the in the in the you know there was a great Chinese place. It it got a B um but but it was still okay and I'm still alive. So, you know, it was it was so it was so it was a B. But we like you know, I like the Chinese place. And and when we played the show in 2015, when we recorded our DVD, it was uh, called Live at the Greek Theater. We, 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 we thought long and hard about that title. And um, it was a tribute to Albert King, Freddie King, and B.B. King. And we got nominated for a Grammy uh, for that show. And when I first played that, I was like, man, I really made it. Because I, I made it from this crappy little apartment with no air conditioning and no electricity and 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 you know it was just dire you know but i came out here with a dream and and a and and a little bit of positive mental attitude and the fact that i can come back to the greek theater again and and play to basically my hometown is is a real super honor and and it's not lost on me it's that place is on par for me with carnegie hall and the Royal Albert Hall and all the great places I've been blessed to, you know, walk on stage and and the Greek theater really means something to me more than not because because I am I am with you all in the traffic in the day to day grind that is Los Angeles and and it may be a sunny place for shady people like us all but I like you kind of people so that's why we're here you know. So, so we're playing there August first. That's a long-winded plug. <laughs> you, 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 you mentioned the the Royal Albert. Oh, that was another place. That was another big deal for you. Wasn't it, it was. It was May fourth, two thousand nine. That was what I would call the equivalent of my musical bar mitzvah. And I, I wanted to play the Albert Hall. Just I, I, I didn't care because you know not many people realize what the Albert Hall. You can rent it out for private parties graduations, proms, they rent it out for anything. I didn't care if I was part of the, the, the London senior high school prom band. Yeah. I just wanted to get in there and, and go. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to be like, I just wanted to be fake Eric Clapton, you know, for a minute. And because of Eric Clapton, you know, if Eric Clapton played the Sizzler Steakhouse on La Brea and Washington for all those years, I would have wanted to play the Sizzler Steakhouse. Yeah. It was the history that he made in that yeah. room that made me want to be yeah. there. And on May 4th, 2009, we got this Monday night gig, and I invited him out. <laughs> like, I'm like... It was one of those things where back then I was fearless. Like now I'm riddled with guilt and fear. <laughs> back when I was 31, I was like, I was fearless. So I wrote him a letter. I just wrote him a letter and I, a friend of mine was nice enough to get it to him because I knew he needed it to him. And I'd met him previously. And I invited him, just like, a, like, a, like any 31-year-old would do, going, I think he would never respond or come. But he, he wrote back. And, and uh, he showed up. And we did further on up the road. And for those six minutes, we recorded a DVD of it. For those six minutes, you can see the best time of my life. First of all, Eric Clapton's on stage. I'm there going, I can't believe I pulled this off. More importantly, I was 10 pounds lighter. You could set your watch to my hairline at the time. It was great. And in those 10 years since we've done the Alba Hall, that's the best I'll ever look, and that's the best it'll ever be. So lucky are the few that get to film 
their best six minutes of their life right there. And so next year we get to go back. Um, You're doing three nights. We're then. doing three nights at the Royal Albert Hall, tenth anniversary of of my musical bar mitzvah, and 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 it, it's again it's not lost on me. I'm, I'm a kooky looking dude who plays blues guitar with a weird last name. You know, it's not lost on. What me. is that? Is that? I was talking about this on the show yesterday. Is it Italian? It is Italian. Yeah, my 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 but my 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 parents and grandparents were all you know. Uh, um, is is my great grandparents' parents? They were they were immigrants from the northern part of Italy, and you know. But the Bonamassas have been here, wreaking havoc musically, uh, for over a hundred years. And I'm a fourth generation musician. My great grandfather played trumpet. My grandfather played trumpet for a living. My dad played guitar for a living and owned music stores. And I, I, I play guitar for a living. And that's been the Bonamassa family business for now since the late 20s. So it's not like you sue. It's not a stage name. No, no. You know, <laughs> you know that's the best question people come and ask me. They're like, is Bonamassa your real last name? And I go, no. You know what? I go, it's actually Smith <laughs> because... The music business is so easy to succeed in that I wanted a little bit of a challenge, you know. <laughs> so I, I and, and to me, Bonamassa is not—it's not a hugely hard name to pronounce, but it has been over the years. But in recent, in recent, uh, you know, years, it's been a little easier for folks to figure out. We're gonna play uh, Black Coffee. This is this the humble pie. Absolutely, Black Coffee. Yeah, and I. I I've been, Beth trying Hart. To, I've been trying to talk Beth into singing this song since we started our collaboration in 2010 because there's only one human being on the planet that could sing that song in the key of G, the proper key of yeah. G, like the late, great Steve Marriott, yeah. and that's Beth Hart. And when we, when we, when we did the song, she, she, she goes, oh, man, can we move it down to F or F sharp? I go, it's a non-event. It's an, it's an event. If it's in, because Steve Marriott for about five years in the 70s is the, was the greatest living rock and roll singer of all time. Yeah. There was, he was unstoppable. Yeah. And he did a version of Black Coffee on the Old Grey Whistle Test with Bob Harris that I've always worshipped. And it's just the most staggeringly good vocal. Yeah. And it's stratospherically high, even for a female singer with a stratospherically high voice like yeah. Beth Hart. And she pulled it off in one of the best possible ways. So yeah. we're very proud of that, that, that version. And I've been lobbying for that song for years. And finally, it was the last song we cut for the record. <laughs> so, yeah. So I got my way eventually, but, uh, but she did a great job. Well, we're going to play it now. Nice. Jonesy's jukebox, Cal OS, Joe Bonamassa, the suit. <laughs>
But that's about it, Joe. All right. That was good. Thanks for coming in, man. Thanks for having me. By the way, I, I just want to say, um, uh, social media is, is a necessary evil in 2018. It is, it is something like you have to do it like, like experimental dental surgery at the Pasadena Dental College and, you know, you know going to the DMV. But by far, and I'm not just saying this because you're here. Uh -oh. I would say it behind your back as well. Uh-oh. Your Instagram page is by far my favorite one to follow. You're, you're a genius and it's classic. So, so my, my hat's off to you for Thank you. A, a great job on your Instagram page. You, you hide it from this guy! It is some of the funniest, most original stuff on, on, uh, on, on, on that, uh, that bloody format. Yeah. <laughs> I've only got, got 60,000 followers. Did you do you do it? Yeah, I do. Yeah. You do it, or does someone do it? No, I I do it because because you know one of the things that, you know about three years ago they said, hey Joe, the people in the office called me. You have to start an Instagram page. I'm like, I don't have to do anything. I'm I'm about to turn forty. Okay, <laughs> I don't have to do anything. I don't want to. By the way, you work for me. And I said, if I'm only, I'm only going to do it. I'm only going to do it if I can control it, and it's going to be non-stop, relentless guitar. Pornography. Yeah. And and now we're 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 about to we we've somehow figured out how to 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 trick over over 392,000 people into subscribing into yeah. this nonstop guitar pornography. Yeah. And it's fun. Yeah. I've got a ways to catch up to you. Maybe I should get some arse implants. <laughs> we're gonna. Uh, what are we doing? We have to say goodbye. We're saying goodbye. We're going into the uh, Duke. We're visiting the Duke. We are. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. Thank you very much. We want to thank our sponsors, Wahoo Fish Tacos, ABK Beers, and Subaru, presenter of the KLOS Subaru Live Stage, the 2018 Subaru Forester versatility that inspires. And, of course, Joe Bonamassa. Thank you very much.